even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, I realize that when I read that, when we hear that from the Apostle Paul, that every one of us here has our own idea of what Paul is saying and isn't saying. And I gather that there are probably still some among us here this evening who read that verse and you have a, you have a sort of a, a theological equation for making sense of that. And it was similar to perhaps my theological equation that I invented that went something like this. All right, God created us. We fell into sin. And because God loved us, he didn't wipe us off the face of the earth, which he could have. But through Noah, rescued us. He calls us to believe He comes in his grace and his love in the incarnate state, taking on flesh in Christ. Christ comes and says, for God so loved the world that whoever believes would not perish but have everlasting life. The Lord wants us to believe. The Lord calls us to believe. And so, this must mean when Paul says he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, It must mean that God, who knows all things, who knows the end from the beginning, who sees not as man sees, but rather can look at the entirety of all of history and the timeline of all world events from the beginning to the end that he has sovereignly orchestrated, and he can look down the corridor of time, and he can know who is going to choose him, who is going to believe, and who isn't. And then, when you consider passages like Romans chapter 8, one I'm sure you're familiar with, where Paul in chapter 8 and verse 29 says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Similar to what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, according to the foreknowledge of God. Well, that makes sense, and it worked into this biblical equation that I invented, because it seems reasonable that God, who knows all things, knew beforehand that he foreknew, looking down the quarter of time, who would believe and who wouldn't, who would choose him and who wouldn't. And so God thus chose those who chose him. God chose from before the foundation of the earth based on his foreknowledge of who would choose him, and thus that's where we have the doctrine, and the language of election in Scripture. So, in essence, we choose God, God chooses us because he knows who chooses us. Now, I realize that most of you realize how fallacious that reasoning is. But I didn't. Many of the men that I was learning from, both on media and local churches, they didn't understand that either. And I can gather that there are probably some here this evening who are still thinking that way. And the problem with that view is that it's not biblical. Not only is it illogical, Not only does it distort the very nature of how God does what he does, how God saves and how God orchestrates and how God loves, it in fact, and what I came to see, is an affront to God. And what I later came to see is that it actually, in one sense, robs God of his glory and gives me the glory. I realize in saying that to some of you that that might sound like a great offense. But here's what I came to realize is that that view, that view that God can look down the quarter of time and choose based on who chooses him, what I realize is that that view, that equation that I had worked up in my mind, in fact, needed to be repented of. The 
reality of it is, is that I was trying to unravel the mystery of God. I was trying to unravel the mind of God rather than just taking God at his word. I was the one to whom Paul was addressing in Romans 9, continuing to ask God, continuing to charge God, continuing to wonder about these things, and continue to not just charge him, but question God. And it's to people like me that Paul had to say in Romans 9, 20, who do you think you are? Who are you to answer back to God? What right does the thing being molded have to say to its molder, its maker, why have you made me like this? Why have you made things like this? Why is this the order and the way that you have established creation and salvation? Through a very, very difficult dark night of the soul and coming to wrestle with these things, I had to come to grips with the question, this is either of God and true, or I must reject the Bible altogether. Welcome back to Narrow Path Doctrine. Once again, my name is Jim. What you just watched was uh, a teaching called Chosen by God from Burke Parsons. Uh, it was a teaching from 2021 at a conference in Detroit, a Ligonier conference. Uh, if you want to watch the entire video i really recommend that you do so i'm going to put a link to it down in the description box and go have a listen to the entire teaching it's awesome what i like about it most is that burke comes at it from a different point of view simply because um well he didn't believe in the doctrines of grace and he kind of had to be dragged into it and i think some in the church many in the church need that as well so go and have a listen to that entire teaching it is well worth your time I want to break it down a little bit. Uh, the The title of this video, I mean, did you choose God or did God choose you? There's a lot of scripture to, to back up what I'm going to be saying today. Uh, unfortunately, I can't cover it all of this video it would be hours and hours long, but I want to cover some of the basics of an acronym that goes by the name of TULIP. A lot of people may be familiar with this acronym and not fans of it, but I think that if you stick around for the entire video, uh, we'll have a little bit more Burke Parsons at the end of the video as well. I think if you stick around for the entire video, you'll see some of the uh, biblical proof for what I'm talking about. And in future videos, I kind of want to cover some of the uh, verses that people bring up and say, well, no, no, that can't be true because this, this, and this. So we'll go over some of those verses as well. But in this video, I want to cover the, the basis of, of TULIP. I'll try not to take too, too much time because I don't want this video to be super long. Uh, but I want to go through a couple of, obviously I want to go through all the acronym uh, points, but I also want to throw out a verse here and there in support of the reformed position. The position that these are indeed the doctrines of grace. This is biblical salvation, as Burke Parsons uh, refers to in that teaching. And this is not man-made doctrine. This is not something that, that man came up with and said, hey, this, this is a great way to look at it. Um, it's referred to as Calvinism in many circles. And I know as soon as a lot of people hear that term Calvinism, they want to shy away immediately and say, you know what, I, wanna, I don't want to have anything to do with that because uh, that's uh, the doctrine of, the, of demons, you know, or something along those lines. I've heard, I've heard tons of it uh, on my Twitter account. I post quite often about the doctrines of of grace and uh, a lot of people come after me uh, about it and uh, I, I don't know I, I can't help but see the doctrines of grace in scripture uh, the way I was saved the way that that God brought me into the faith uh, I didn't have a choice but to believe the doctrine of faith so uh, sorry the doctrines of grace so at the end of the day uh, this is something that I truly believe something that I think that that everyone should be aware of and that everyone should see uh, it, it, it's completely biblical. It's supported in Scripture. And the main key point is that it gives all the glory to God and none to man. We don't deserve any glory. God chose us. God brought us to faith. And when you see that, it's easy to get down on your knees and say, thank you. Thank you. Why me, though? Why me? That's the point of the doctrines of grace. So I want to take a look at this. The tulip, uh, the canons of Dort is is what this is is 
is centered on this this um, I'm going to link this web page down in the description box as well but let's just go over some of the things in here um, the decision of the Synod of Dort on the five main points of doctrine in the Netherlands known more simply as the canons of Dort you might have heard that term before it's an official document written by the National Synod of the Reformed Churches in the Netherlands it was written in 1619 and represented the official response to another document now that other document was the remonstrance I believe I'm pronouncing that right written in 1610 by the followers of Jacob Arminius you may have ter- heard the term Arminius or his name or the term Arminian that is kind of the opposite I guess of uh, those who don't necessarily follow John Calvin but refer to it as Calvinism again we have to keep in mind that this is not following John Calvin this was around the church fathers knew of the doctrines of grace long before John Calvin came on the scene. He simply brought it to the forefront, and that's why it's referred to as Calvinism. So this is not following John Calvin. This is not following man. This is following the Bible. This is biblical salvation. Now, the writers of the Canons of Dort organized their arguments in five points, each corresponding to the five points set out in that document that was written by Arminius. And these five points have come to be known as the five points of Calvinism. And it's known by the acronym, easy to remember acronym, TULIP. Let's have a drink of coffee. It's still early in the morning here. So So these five um, acronyms here, or the acronym TULIP, these five points, we'll start off with total depravity, the T in TULIP. Now, if we take a look at uh, in the Arminian position, so the followers of Jacob Arminius, They believe that man is spiritually sick. Fallen man was seriously affected by the fall, but he still has the ability to choose spiritual good. He determines the eternal destiny by either accepting or rejecting God's mercies. Now, as you can see, it's all up to man there. It's not up to God. It's up to man. That's just, that should immediately be a red flag to you that that man is responsible for his salvation and not God. God is the one that gets the glory, not us. Anyway, I digress. The Reformed position, man is spiritually dead because of the fall. Man has become spiritually dead, blinded, and deaf to the things of God, and is therefore unable of himself to choose spiritual good and determine his own destiny. Does that not sound sound more like, I mean, what can a med, dead man do? As I think Steve Lawson says, all a dead man can do is stink. He certainly can't save himself. We'll take a look at um, Ephesians 2, 1 to uh, verse 3. This is the new King James, I think, that they have. I prefer the King James, but we'll we'll go with what they have on this webpage here. Um, It reads, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, or Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So this is uh, this is a, a good basis right there. The Ephesians uh, letter to the Ephesians, Paul's letter, really brings the doctrines of grace to full fruition, in my opinion. Romans covers it quite a bit, but Ephesians is very important. So let's take a look down a little further here at the U in the acronym TULIP. This stands for unconditional election. Now the Arminian position says God's election is based on man's foreseen faith before the foundation of the world. God chose certain individuals for salvation based on his foreseeing that they would, of their own free will, choose Christ. Now this is this is a very very common belief out there amongst Christians that I have found that well God saw I mean he looked down the corridors of time and he saw that I would choose God so he chose me so again that gives man the glory and not God the glory if he's choosing you based on you choosing him and what we read earlier from Ephesians we're dead. We're dead in our sins and trespasses. How could we ever choose God? It's it's not possible. We want nothing to do with God. Okay, so anyway, that is the Arminian position. The Reformed position says God's election is unconditional. God's choice of certain individuals for salvation was not based on any foreseen response of obedience on their part, but was based solely in his good and sovereign will. So once again, 
God gets all the glory. It is for his good, his will. It is for his glory and who he decides to save. Listen, if if we if we got if we got what we deserve, every single person would be on their way to hell. God, in his mercy and his grace, decided to choose to save some of us. Why? We don't know. We don't know. And I can't answer that today, and I certainly won't be able to answer that. I wish I could, but I don't know the mind of God because I'm not God. I'm a, I'm a, I am a finite man, and God is an infinite being. So at the end of the day, we have to rest in the fact that God chose who he chose based on his own sovereign will. All right, so we'll take a look at uh, some quotes here or some verses John 6:37 to John 6:39 this is in support of the reformed position all that the father gives me will come to me this is Jesus speaking and the one who comes to me i will by no means cast out so all that the father gives me will come to me that doesn't sound like the man chose the father gave him to me anyway and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out eternal salvation, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. All right, let's move on to the next letter in the acronym of TULIP. It is Limited Atonement, the Armenian position says Christ's death was designed to make salvation possible for all people. Again, very common out there in Twitter land or X land, whatever you want to refer to it as these days. And, uh, and most of uh, Christianity that I see, Christ's death made salvation possible for everyone, but it did not actually secure or guarantee the salvation of anyone. Does that seem like something God would do? Fallen man determines whether or not Christ's work will be effective by his faith. So what the Arminian position is stating here is that Christ came, he died, and now he's hoping, he's hoping that, that you know, people will choose him. So he may, he died for everyone. So he shed his blood for every single person, but only some of them decide to choose Christ and follow him. So of all the people that he died for and shed his blood, they still go to hell and they have to pay their way. Didn't Jesus pay for that already with his blood? But, you know, they didn't, I don't know, I've heard the term activate their salvation by putting their faith. So his blood is just kind of sitting there, you know, hanging there and and, and, and we activate it by, by giving our faith doesn't make any sense to me but anyway the reform position on this says christ's death was designed to actually secure the salvation of all god's chosen people christ's death secured and actually accomplished the salvation of all of god's chosen people god has dis determined that all for whom christ sacrificed himself will be saved doesn't that sound doesn't that sound more more like something god would do it does to me so let's take a look here. Let's see. Um, I don't know which one. Let's take a look at uh, Romans 5, 8 through Romans 5, 10. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, reconciled to God, through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. All right, let's move on to the next point in the acronym here, the next letter. There's a lot of support for that last one. Irresistible grace. So we're at the I in TULIP. Now, the Arminian position says that the Holy Spirit cannot regenerate fallen man until he believes. The Holy Spirit does all he can to bring every fallen man to salvation, but until fallen man responds in faith of his own free will, so he just got to hang on to that free will. The Spirit cannot give life. Faith preceded and makes possible the new birth. Faith gives life. Again, this is a very common belief and a very common uh, thing that I see out there in, in the Christian world. And so again, Christ is what? Pacing up in heaven, pining back and forth, just hoping that you will believe, hoping that you will, of your own free will, choose him and that he can save you? Does this sound like something God would do? 
The Reformed position, the Holy Spirit regenerates every one of God's chosen people, enabling them to believe. He grants you the faith. The Holy Spirit graciously regenerates every one of God's chosen people, creating within them a new heart and enabling them to freely and willingly believe in Christ as Savior and Lord. The new birth precedes and makes possible saving faith. Life gives faith. God grants that faith to you. He regenerates you. He gives you a new heart and gives you the ability to wake up and to choose him. This is so important. Again, let's take a look at uh, John 644 here. This is looking at the irresistible grace uh, portion of the acronym. This is a pretty famous verse and one that really brings it home for me. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. If you take a look at the Greek word there for draws, that actually could be better translated as drag. So... So we could read that as, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me drags him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So this irresistible grace is in fact irresistible. And a lot of Christians who don't believe in the doctrines of grace think that, well, you know, the Holy Spirit wouldn't force me, God wouldn't force me. At the end of the day, you know what, when we when we look at the term free will, we can think of it this way. You you don't really have free will unfortunately either you are of your father the devil or you are in christ so either you are a slave to sin or you are a slave to christ i don't see the free will there at all but anyway i digress once again let's uh, let's go down to the last portion of the tulip acronym and this is perseverance of the saints the arminian position says all who believe and are truly saved can lose their salvation lose it so you better you best hang on to it you know uh, because you can lose it at any point in time sinners can lose their salvation by failing to keep up their faith by feeling or falling into a state of serious sin etc you know what i'm not i'm not going to sit here and say that we don't sin because the bible clearly says that we do sin and if we say we aren't sinners then we're liars right i think it's in first john but at the end of the day if 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 we if we believe that we can lose our salvation, where is the confidence in that? Jesus said to 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 rest in me. I have overcome the world. Uh, if we're sitting here thinking that any moment in time that God can just say, you know what, yeah, you've sinned enough. I, I'm I'm gone. I'm out of here. That that just makes no sense. And there's so many verses out there to back up eternal salvation. Jesus said that I grant them eternal life. Eternal life is eternal it, it isn't just for a time or until you know they they fall away or until they say well i don't want to do this anymore you know what if anybody says that and they walk away from the faith they deconstruct their christian faith i think is the new thing they were never of us because they they went out from us anyway the reform position for the perseverance of the saints says all who are chosen by god redeemed by christ and regenerated by the holy spirit are eternally saved they are kept in faith by the power of the almighty god and therefore continue to persevere in the faith if god can't keep you if the holy spirit in you that regenerated you can't keep you then who can john macarthur put it very succinctly when he said that if i could lose my salvation i would the second you wake up in the morning, any passing thought that you have, anything that you... Jesus said, if you look upon a woman with lust, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. There's no one watching this video, man or woman, that can say that they haven't looked at somebody with lust. It's, it's a default thing that our, our minds do. We have fallen. We are sinful creatures. We do it. So we lose our salvation then if, if, we, if we do it more often if we if we i'm not saying that uh, that a truly saved christian will live a sinful lifestyle and will live in sin that that's easy believism and it's false it's it's more often referred to as once saved always saved and while i believe that once you are saved you are saved for sure for sure you at the end of the day if you are truly a new creature you are born again you are saved and regenerated by the holy spirit you know what you will walk in the spirit you will walk in the faith you will have new passions you will have new desires you will read the word of god you will love the word of god and you will live a lifestyle that 
is in accordance with what Jesus taught, with what Paul spoke about in his epistles. All right. I want to do a video on eternal security as well. We'll do that down the road. But the next video, I hope, is probably to take a look at some of the Bible verses that people bring out and say, well, see, the doctrines of grace are false. Calvinism is the doctrine of demons. Uh, look at this verse and look at this verse. This says the world. This says all. Well, we're going to take a look at some of those Bible verses. We're going to look at the original language and we're going to see in the context what the word all or world means. OK, so we'll take a look at that. I'm going to sign off now. I'm going to leave you with a little bit more of Burke Parsons from that Chosen by God teaching, an amazing teaching. Teaching Again, I recommend, highly recommend you go and listen to the entire thing. And I will leave a link down in the description box to this webpage, the uh, TULIP acronym with scriptures. So you can take a look at some of the other scriptures that they focus on. Again, I couldn't read them all. We don't want to be here for hours. All right. So until next time, doctrine matters. God bless. God takes us from the realm of darkness, takes our cold, dead, hard hearts, and gives us new hearts of flesh that are pliable, moldable, soft, broken, and contrite. God takes us into his own family, and that means that we do not have to worry. We're his forever. We don't have to worry that he's going to kick us out. We don't have to worry that he's no longer going to be our father someday that we are adopted by our God and his sovereign work, that we had nothing to do with it because the reality of it is, if we could lose our salvation, we would. If we could run away from God, we would. How many times in your life have you felt like running away? Now, some of you might say, I've never felt like running away. Well, thanks be to God. But the reason you don't run away, the reason you don't leave God is because he won't let you. What would you do to keep your children from running away from you, from running away from God? Think about what lengths you would go to to keep your children safe and to keep them in. And we're talking about the creator and almighty God of everything. That's why Paul can state boldly throughout all of his letters, it's God who begins a good work in you. It's God who's faithful to complete it. God is the one who has secured you, and our adoption is like the stamp of that security. We are adopted by God as his sons through Christ Jesus. Notice that everything is through Christ. Everything is in Christ. Everything is by Christ according to the good purpose of his will. This could be translated the good pleasure of his will. This is really what I didn't understand and what many people don't understand that they can't grasp how God would save and only save a certain people for himself. But he does it according to the good pleasure of his will. You know, a lot of times people accuse those of us who are Reformed, those of us who understand Reformed uh, soteriology, which really doesn't need to be said in that way. It's just biblical salvation. It's just the biblical doctrine of salvation. Those of us who understand these things and believe these things are often accused by others of trying to unravel and figure out the mind of God. Have you ever been accused of that? They say, you know, you're trying to figure out the mysteries of God. You're trying to delve into the, the mind of God and understand things that we really cannot understand. And we shouldn't go to that degree when the reality of it is, is that God has revealed these mysteries to us. This is what Paul says in Ephesians, that these are mysteries that have been revealed. Now, God didn't have to tell us all this, did he? God didn't have to reveal all this to us. He didn't have to tell us how he did what he did and why he did what he did. But he told us all these things so that we would know that it's all of his grace. So that we would be able to recognize what wretched sinners we really are so that we could sing and could understand and could grasp what amazing grace really is. I think that most of you would be able to agree with me that until you came to understand the biblical doctrine of salvation, you really didn't understand grace. And that's why I worry for so many people who call themselves Christians if they haven't 
grappled with this, if they haven't come to understand the sovereignty of God and salvation, if they haven't yet come to, to understand the significance of it and the why of it, I really do wonder, do they know Christ at all? I know many of them do. And thankfully, thankfully they love the Lord and with a simple understanding, maybe a simple faith at times, maybe a beautiful faith, You've talked to people, I have, I know, over the years, people who come to grasp the biblical doctrine of election and God's sovereignty and salvation. They say, it's like I was converted a second time. Have you heard that? Here's the reality. I think for a lot of people, they were converted for the first time. Because dearly beloved, It's only when we come to grasp these things, it's only when we come to understand God's role in our salvation that we really do get humbled to our knees so that we might rise up to praise him and burst out with exuberance saying, God, thank you. Why me? Why did you choose me? I don't deserve to be chosen. I don't deserve to be among your elect. Why did you set your love upon me? Why did you foreknow me? Why did you create me? Because it's only when you get to that point when you really understand what salvation is. And that's why we as God's people who understand these things ought to be the most humble Christians that anyone else knows. And too often, too often, we are pointing at ourselves saying, look at us, look what I've come to understand. Look at what I've come to grasp. I have the higher knowledge. I've been to a Ligonier conference. I read table talk. (laughs) When we ought to be a people. And that's what I love about, that's what I love about older Christians. I love to hear them pray. You ever hear an older saint pray? You notice that their prayers sound an awful lot like the prayers of children. It's because the more you grow in the grace of God and understanding the sovereignty of God, the more you become more childlike in your faith, more dependent upon the Lord, more able to say that it really was by his grace. 